Hello, I'm Professor Sims, and this video is about your respiratory system infections. This is the sixth of ten lessons included in my pathogenic microbiology course. If you are currently enrolled in this course, please consult the syllabus and the course Moodle site for assignments and other information. The learning objectives for this unit include describing the major anatomical features, and the normal microbiota of the upper and lower respiratory tracts. We'll talk about how microorganisms overcome defenses of the upper and lower respiratory tract membranes, and we'll talk about the signs and symptoms for infections of the respiratory system, the most common bacterial, viral, and fungal infections of the respiratory tract. The respiratory tract serves the vital function of exchanging gases between the atmosphere and the blood. Anatomists commonly divide the respiratory system into the upper respiratory tract and the lower respiratory tract. The upper respiratory system, this is uh, the part that collects air. It filters dust and pollen and other microbes uh, from the air, and it delivers it to the lower respiratory organs. The upper respiratory system includes the nose, which is the only external part of the respiratory tract, the nasal cavity, which is lined with hairs and a ciliated mucous membrane, receives air from the nose. The hairs filter large dust particles and organisms from the air, while the sticky mucus traps smaller particles and microbes. Ciliary, ciliary action moves nasal mucus and its contents down into the throat. Sinuses, which are air-filled hollow regions of bones in the skull with the nasal cavity. The pharynx, which is shared with the digestive system, is lined with a ciliated mucous membrane that propels mucus and contaminants into the digestive system. A flap extending from the roof of the mouth, called the uvula, partially closes the opening between the nasal cavity and the pharynx during swallowing. The mucus of the upper respiratory system contains antimicrobial chemicals, including defensins, lactoferrin, and lysozymes. The lower respiratory system consists of a series of tubes. The larynx, or the voice box, the trachea, or the windpipe, bronchi, bronchioles, and smaller respiratory tubes, these all lead to hundreds of millions of microscopic air sacs called alveoli and the lungs. Protective membranes called pleurae surround the lungs. The major respiratory muscle is the diaphragm located below the lungs. Because the structures of the lower respiratory tract resemble an upside down tree with branches that gradually decrease in diameter while increasing in number, anatomists refer to it as the respiratory tree. In this analogy, the trachea is the trunk, the bronchi and the smaller tubes are the branches, and the alveoli represent the leaves. When the diaphragm contracts, the lungs inflate, the air flows from the nose to the pharynx and into the respiratory tree. A ciliated mucous membrane lines the trachea, bronchi, and bronchioles. The cilia beat about a thousand times per minute, and this carries mucus and trapped contaminants up to the pharynx. Physiologists refer to this action as a ciliary escalator. The mucus and its contents pass into the digestive system where digestive juices destroy them. Further protection from pathogens is provided by the alveoli macrophages, which enter the alveoli from blood capillaries, and then they devour microbes. Secretory antibodies in the tears, saliva, and respiratory mucus also provide protect protection from many pathogens. The ears are connected to the upper respiratory tract by the estuaration tube, which opens to the nasopharynx. Goblet cells within the respiratory epithelium secrete sticky mucus, and then these, this here is showing the ciliated epithelial cells, which contribute to what is known as the ciliary escalator. This is the phenomenon that helps you to ingest inhaled microbes rather than letting those microbes enter into your lower respiratory tract. The upper respiratory tract has a whole huge diversity of normal microbiota. The lower respiratory tract has relatively few, usually transient microbes. Normal microbiota can cause opportunistic infections, but there are vaccines that are available for common respiratory pathogens, be they bacterial or viral. 
Most respi respiratory infections cause inflammation. They usually have names that end in itis, such as rhinitis, sinitis, uh, pharyngitis, bronchitis. This again is a table. You know how I love my tables. These are some important respiratory diseases and vaccines that are generally used to treat those diseases. We're going to go through many of these in the following slides. Your strep throat is caused by Streptococcus pyogenes. Streptococcus pyogenes not only causes strep throat, but it also can cause uh, scarlet fever, acute rheumatic fever, and acute glomerulonephritis. And this is figure 22.6 showing the bright red arches of localized pharyngitis and strep throat has a similar appearance. And then this here is the rash that occurs due to scarlet fever. Acute otitis media is an infection of the middle ear. This is usually caused by several bacterial genres. You have your streptococcus, your hemophilus, or your moraxalis. So streptococcus pneumoniae, your hemophilus influenzae, and your moraxala cateralis. These can all cause the middle ear infections. This figure here is showing a healthy eardrum, and this is an infected eardrum here on the right. Diphtheria is caused by Carinbacterium diphtheriae, and it used to be a very common disease, but now it's quite rare because of the vaccines that have been developed for it. Carinbacterium diphtheriae causes, uh, it produces exotoxins, and exotoxins can kill cells and tissues in the pharynx. This causes the formation of a pseudomembrane, and it can damage your pharynx, it can damage your voice box, and it causes damage to other parts of your body if it spreads. Bacterial pneumonia results from the infections of uh, Streptococcus pneumoniae, usually, or Hemophilus influenzae. Uh, you even can have bacterial pneumonia caused by Klebsiella pneumoniae. There's several other species. These are just the most common here. And this causes inflammation and fluid accumulation in the areola of the lungs. This figure here is showing a chest radiograph with lesions on the lungs. And there's some fluid accumulation in the lungs. Microplasma pneumoniae is, ca is caused by microplasma pneumoniae. <laughs> it spreads rather quickly, but it is quite self-limiting. So usually it is something that has a rapid onset, but it is self-limiting, which means that it usually depletes the nutrients in the tissue that it's living in because, because it grows so rapidly, which means that it doesn't have a chance to spread to a wide area before it starts to die off. Chlamydial pneumonia is uh, an infection of the lungs and ciliated cells of the airways. This is what causes not only pneumonia, but uh, bronchitis. Symptoms include cough, low-grade fever, pharyngitis, laryngitis, and sinitis. Tuberculosis is also a respiratory disease. Tuberculosis results in the formation of tubercles, and the infection is walled off by your leukocytes in the white blood cells. Sequestered bacteria may be reactivated to form secondary tuberculosis if you are in an immunocompromised patient. So this figure here is showing kind of the formation of the tubercules and the walling off. Pertussis is caused by Bordetella pertussis, and this is uh, the causative agent of whooping cough. It causes accumulation of mucus in the lungs. It causes a very, very severe kind of a uh, what they call a barking cough, and that cough actually facilitates transmission of the bacteria not only within the respiratory tract of the individual that's infected, but it also helps to transmit from one person to another. There is a vaccine for whooping cough, but outbreaks are still common, especially in young, very young children or the elderly. Legionnaire's disease is caused by uh, Legionella pneumophila, and it is an endocytic bacterium. It is a very severe pneumonia, especially in immunocompromised patients. I included this figure here that's not in your book, but um, it does show kind of the life cycle of Legionella disease. This is also another biofilm forming bacteria, which increases its virulence. And many, many of these pneumonias are capsule forming bacteria, which aids in adherence and it prevents them from 
being able to be physically removed from the lungs. So you have you have this cough that is very persistent, persistent, but nothing is coming up. That's very typical of your pneumonias. Q fever is is a zoonotic disease, and it's usually transferred from domesticated animals to humans. It's really common in farm workers, and it can lead to endocarditis. Viral infections of the respiratory tract are very frequent. They're, in fact, they are more frequent than bacterial infections of the respiratory tract. Some viral infections, you can have it and not even know you have it because the symptoms are so mild. Some of these viral infections, you all know, things like the common cold. The common cold is caused by no less than 200 different viruses, which is why there is no cure. But uh, it's usually a rhinovirus, a coronavirus, or an adenovirus. These are all transmitted by direct contact, aerosols, or by touching fomites. These are not going to be things that are vector transmitted. They're generally from direct contact with either droplets or fomites that are infected or aerosols in the air. Influenza is a really, really important uh, viral infection of the respiratory tract. The thing that makes influenza so difficult to treat, it's not because it's caused by so many different types of viruses like the common cold. It's because it is capable of mutating very rapidly. In the case of um, some species, it is having to do with antigenic drift. Other ones have antigenic shift. But anyway, they have different mechanisms which makes them able to mutate very rapidly, which is why you know, every year when they're developing flu vaccines, they have to develop several different vaccines to treat several different strains of the same species of influenza. And sometimes they predict the right strains and sometimes they don't. And uh, some viral infections, including your respiratory syncytial virus infections, uh, these are occurring in really young children, and they can start with really mild symptoms, symptoms that are so mild that you don't have outward signs of infection, um, but then they will eventually progress into a viral pneumonia. So um, figure 2217 is showing the structure of the influenza virus. It has a viral envelope that has all of these different copies of proteins and hemagglutinin, and it surrounds the RNA genome segments on the inside. So this is actually a quite hardy individual here. He's got lots of layers of protection that keeps his uh, genetic information hidden from the host. RSV is the most important cause of pneumonia. RSV is especially important in very young children. Nearly half of all hospital admissions in the U.S. of infants less than two years old are due to RSV infection. And this here is showing the structure of the RSV virus. SARS and MERS are acute respiratory infections that are both caused by coronaviruses. Um, they have been able to determine that these viruses originated in animals, so they are being transmitted from animals to humans. SARS hasn't been seen in the human population since 2004, but the most recent SARS outbreak was very severe, very widespread, and there was a very high human mortality rate associated with this outbreak. MERS is also really, really deadly, and unfortunately, we are still seeing outbreaks of MERS today. Measles, rubella, chickenpox, these are all very uh, contagious and systemic viral infections. They are not always associated with the respiratory tract, but they actually gain entry to the body through the respiratory system. They eventually end up causing rashes and fevers and things like that, but they do start out as a respiratory disease. Effective vaccines are available for measles and rubella and chickenpox, but um, as we've discussed in previous lessons, uh, vaccination rates are on the decline, which means that infection rates are increasing. Of these three diseases, uh, measles is the most severe, and we're seeing a very, very scary uptick of measles infections in the U.S. Um, this, it seems like it's just a rash, and people think, oh, it's just measles. It's just like chickenpox. But no, measles is absolutely fatal in several cases, and it should be treated as a very, very serious respiratory disease. Chickenpox is usually an infection associated with children. 
but um, if you have chicken pox as a child, the virus can reactivate later in life, and that is what causes shingles. Shingles is very painful rash, and when it does occur, it's usually in elderly people, people that are 65 or above, which means that you know they're already having other issues, likely with um, immunocompromising effects. And then you add shingles into the mix, and it's just it's just horrible. It's a horrible disease. So figure 2218 is showing uh, some images associated with measles. So here on the, the left is the typical rash that you would see on the skin with measles infection. Um, here in the middle, you have these things called coplex spots that occur inside of the mouth. And then here on the right is a transcription transmission electron micrograph of the actual virion, um, which is amazing. This is this has gone all the way down to 50 nanometers. Figure 2219 is showing German measles or uh, rubella. And again, there's a rash on the skin, a raised, irritated, itchy, inflamed rash. This one is not as bad as the rash that you see in measles. Um, this over here, again, is a transmission micrograph of the virus itself. This one is one that has just started budding. In other words, it is um, just being released from the host cells. It's just finished reproducing inside of the host cell. 2220 is showing the pustular chickenpox rash. Rash. It is concentrated in the trunk region. What's, what the, that means is that it is not usually as concentrated in the legs and arms, the limbs, as it is in the back chest and stomach area. <clears throat> Over here on the right is a transmission micrograph showing a viroid of human herpes virus. This is the virus that actually causes chicken pox in children and it causes shingles when it's reactivated in older adults. Figure 2221 is showing some images of the shingles. So as you can see this rash looks quite different from the rash that you would see with chicken pox and it is not only very itchy and inflamed but it is quite painful it causes severe pain fungal pathogens are rare well fungal pathogens rarely cause respiratory disease in healthy people but as with many other diseases if you're dealing with patients that are already immunocompromised and they inhale the spores it can cause very severe pneumonia and even systemic infections you have uh, antifungal drugs, antifungal drugs like amphotericin B that controls most fungal infections. Histoplasmosis is uh, it's a disease caused by mold. It grows in soil that is very rich in bird or bat droppings, uh, guano droppings. Bat droppings are called guano. Histoplasmosis is very commonly transmitted when spores are airborne, and this happens when um, buildings are being demolished or areas are being cleaned up and it just kind of riles up all of these spores in the air and then all of a sudden you have a widespread epidemic of histoplasmosis um, most of the time individuals don't become very sick but some people those that are already susceptible can have um, these abnormal cells that grow inside of their phagocytes which means that the phagocytes are the cells that help fight off infection so if they're already susceptible, then the histoplasmosis can alter their phagocytes to where their phagocytes can't fight off other secondary infections. So this here is a, a figure taken from the CDC, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. And it's just kind of a schematic showing how histoplasmosis, um, where it comes from, how the spores are released, how they come into the respiratory system via inhalation, and then the cells, the spores um, germinate in the cells and in the lymph and in the blood. And that's how it can become systemic infection throughout the body. And then this is showing the incidence of histoplasmosis in the United States, where you have um, essentially no infection whatsoever. And then you have suspected areas where they think that it could spread. Then you have mildly endemic. So they, they do see them at a rather low rate on a normal normal basis, and moderately endemic. And then here in the dark green is where they have 
normally have a high, a relatively high rate of histoplasmosis presence. Coxodiodomycosis comes from soil and uh, it can cause these really gnarly lesions on the face. In extreme cases, it can affect other it can infect other organs and it can even be fatal. This is uh, figure 22-23, a patient that has extensive facial lesions due to disseminated disseminated coccidiodes, extensive facial lesions due to disseminated coccidiodes infection. Extensive facial lesions due to disseminated coccidiodes infection. And then over here you have some immunofluorescence that's been used to show the spiral of uh, one of these species of coccidiodes endospores. Blasted mycosis is a uh, rare disease. It comes from a fungus that lives in the soil it usually causes a mild infection of the lungs, but um, it can, in immunocompromised individuals, cause a systemic infection, and it can even be fatal if it's left untreated. The figure 2225 is showing skin lesions. So um, I don't know if you guys have ever seen this, but I think it was Ripley's Believe It or Not or Discovery Channel, something like that, where they showed this guy that uh, they called him Tree Man, the Tree Man, because he had all of these lesions on his skin that made it look like his skin was made out of bark. Well, that guy had a very se severe blastomycosis infection. Mucormycosis, this is a pretty rare fungal infection, but it is worth talking about because it can involve growth of the hyphae in the infected tissues, and it can lead to death um, if untreated. So this figure here is showing a pretty severe case of infection of the mouth and the nose. And like you can see that this lady's here, the, the tissue has started to, to die off to the point where she almost doesn't have a nose anymore. In fact, this nose would have to be amputated. Aspergillosis, aspergillosis, this is another soil fungus that infects immunocompromised people. It causes hyphal balls to grow in the lungs, and it impedes lung function and causes shortness of breath, and if it gets bad enough, it can also be fatal. Pneumocystis pneumoniae is caused by Pneumocystis gyrovesi. It's common in AIDS patients and other, again, and other immunocompromised people. You can treat these with what is known as sulfa drugs. But this has um, side effects that can be really, really bad. But if you don't treat them, then they are very oftentimes fatal. Cryptococcosis is caused by Cryptococcus neoformanus. And these are lung infections that can migrate to the brain, which causes um, meningitis that can be fatal. So this concludes the Lesson 6 material that we're going to cover. Thank you guys, as always, for watching. Don't forget to do the reading. Check the description below for more videos related to these topics. Make sure you have a look at all of the tables in the textbook. That's going to be really important. And leave your questions for me in the comments section below.